Chicago's very own 9 o'clock news. Good evening. Pat is taking the night off again tonight. The FAA says engine problems may have been the cause of this morning's crash of Delta Flight 1141 that went down at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Thirteen people were killed. Miraculously, more than 90 other persons aboard survived the crash. About 30 of the survivors are hospitalized tonight. Delta Flight 1141 was taking off for Salt Lake City this morning when passengers noticed the plane was having trouble getting off the ground. The gear, the wheels and everything collapsed on the left side of the plane, and the wing on the left side just scraped the runway the whole way up, all the way out. He was going to take off, but he didn't have enough power. An airport spokesman said the pilot told the control tower just before the crash that there was smoke and fire inside his Boeing 727 and that he was trying to abort the takeoff. Witnesses said the plane lifted off the ground slightly but then slid back and crashed just after clearing the runway. When we landed, uh, the center of the plane caught on fire. I mean, I could look behind me and see the, uh, the flames. The crash snapped the plane into three parts. The survivors scrambled out through two holes in the fuselage. A member of the rescue team said most of those who survived got themselves out of the wreckage. One survivor said the passengers remained relatively calm. And people got up in a very orderly manner and exited out both exits. Uh, Wasn't any screaming or anything? Very little. It will take months to determine the cause of the crash, but the fact that the cockpit crew survived will help the investigation. The crew will be able to tell them exactly what they experienced and, and what their uh, 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 reactions were, what the, what the indications were in the cockpit, uh, so that you, you don't have to go back and reconstruct that fact. Members of the National Transportation Safety Board already are on the scene, tagging pieces of wreckage which they hope will tell them why Delta Flight 1141 crashed this morning. No closed doors. Everything is open. We're objective and we're just trying to document the, uh, whatever we can find before we do anything. Airport officials say it is remarkable that so many passengers and crew members were able to survive the explosion and fire. And we'll have more on today's crash in Dallas later in this news hour. Governor Thompson today announced he will indeed sign Chicago's school reform bill, but not until he uses his mandatory veto power to make a handful of changes. The bill was passed in early July by the Illinois General Assembly amid considerable controversy. Thompson says as it stands, though, the bill is not school reform. Jim Williams reports on the revisions the governor now plans to make. Governor Thompson says the changes are necessary and were made without political considerations. I am not going to put school reform into a political quarrel of any kind. It's too important. I think it is important today to make changes which I personally believe as a governor and as a parent will make a good bill better. These are among the changes Thompson believes will make the bill better. Greater power to local councils to give parents a bigger role in the school system. School principals would have the authority to hire teachers without regard to seniority. Magnet, vocational, and technical schools would not be eliminated. Selection of the Chicago School Reform Oversight Committee would change. The governor making three appointments, the mayor making three. Both the governor and the mayor would select the chairman. If you use the same process for appointment of the oversight authority as you do for appointment of the Chicago School Board, that is mayor, mayor, you don't have oversight. You have the same control at both levels. That is not oversight. Mayor Sawyer's press secretary says the mayor does not object to the change. If the packet is as the governor described it to the mayor, then the mayor says he sees nothing that he'd object to. Democrats in the General Assembly will determine whether the bill wins approval. House Speaker Michael Madigan didn't endorse the changes. He says approval is up to the lawmakers who drafted the legislation. I will convene the educational advocacy groups that drafted this bill and ask for their reaction to the governor's ideas. And if they say it's okay, then it's okay with you? Basically, basically underscored, yes. Democratic Senator Arthur Berman, the chief sponsor of the bill, believes the changes will be approved. There will be substantial debate, but I think that we can muster majorities in both the Senate and in the House uh, to pass the bill and to uh, bring reform to Chicago. Governor Thompson will sign the bill on September 26th here at Lane Tech High School. The bill will then go on to Springfield, where Governor Thompson says it will win overwhelming support from Republicans. He says only a few Democratic votes are needed to make school reform a reality in Chicago. Jim Williams, WGN News.
Well, joining us to talk about school reform and the amendatory veto, news analyst Joel Wiseman. Let's talk about this animal, the amendatory veto. Good news, bad news. The legislators are not real wild about it. The governor says it's necessary. Very controversial thing put in in the state's new constitution. It allows, really, the governor to uh, rewrite, rewrite legislation. And, uh, of course, here he had an, an easy way to do it because there were some mistakes, so he corrected the mistakes. Magnet schools among them. And then added some, uh, some points of his own. And when you have an amendatory veto, it then goes back to the legislature, and you need a simple majority to adopt the amendatory veto and the whole bill. If In they don't words, act, then, then the thing remains vetoed. The whole thing dies. Right. Alternatively, they can't override, but it takes a three-fifths vote. That's right. So we can, it, it could go either way in Springfield. Right. What they're going to do is have a debate as to whether they want this majority vote. I think it'll probably go through, and it turns out to give a lot more political points to Jim Thompson. Okay, now the amendatory veto is not unique to the governmental system here in Illinois. A majority of the states have amendatory vetoes, and President Reagan wants it at the White House level. Some of them have different forms of it. Uh, uh, Illinois was one of the kind of middle states to get it. Uh, they, we, we've ch had it challenged in court, and it has been upheld but they do talk about eliminating it and perhaps yet another constitution. Now, earlier in the week, Mike Madigan, the Speaker of the House, was saying that the governor tends to over-exercise, overuse, and abuse the amendatory veto. In fact, he's only used it about 8% of the time with the legislation that's crossed his desk. In your opinion, does he abuse it or no? I, in my opinion, he does not. Uh, and more importantly, he hasn't used it any differently than past governors, namely Ogilvy and Walker. In Springfield, what do you predict the fate of the school reform bill will be? Is it going to be upheld? Well, if you want reform, you've got to accept this amendatory veto. And one sort of enticement to it is that it will begin in January 1st, whereas the regular bill that, that he has amended wouldn't begin until next July. So I think it's going to go through, but not without an awful lot of debate. The key issue here is this oversight committee where the mayor and the governor have to agree on a chairman. And you know sometimes that's sticky. You were most recently with the White Sox Stadium Authority. Okay, Joel. Thank okay. you much. That flap over trains being required to sound warning horns at all grade crossings across the state has been resolved. Trains began sounding warnings last week under that new state law. Well, angry suburban residents didn't like it. They couldn't sleep, and they complained, and loudly. The Illinois Commerce Commission has now decided most grade crossings in the Chicago metropolitan area, in fact, do have adequate protection without the warning horns. And so today, the commission voted unanimously to exempt all but three Chicago area crossings from the new horn warning order. Warning horns will still be required at those three non-exempt crossings. All of them are in Chicago on the northwest side. Still to come on our 9 o'clock news, Chicago polls rally here to show support for an apparent breakthrough for unions in Poland. And later, Chicago's very own Motorcycle Mamas and their magazine. Chicago's Polish community is showing its support tonight for the outlawed Solidarity Union back home as word comes of a possible breakthrough to end the latest labor unrest in Poland. Several hundred people marched outside the Polish consulate on Chicago's near north side tonight. It was a rally for Solidarity founder Lech Wałęsa and his reported progress in negotiations with the Polish government. Wałęsa said today the government has agreed to discuss the possibility of reviving Solidarity if the current strikes in Poland come to an end. Wałęsa now is calling on Polish workers to settle their walkouts and end what has become Poland's worst labor unrest in seven years. An Army board late tonight found 23-year-old ROTC cadet Scott Swanson guilty of willfully evading his contractual obligations and recommended he be kicked out of the program. Steve Sanders was at the hearing at Fort Sheridan and reports the findings must now go to the ROTC national commander for final approval. Scott Swanson says he is actually pleased with the decision giving him the boot from ROTC, admitting that it could have been a lot worse. They're wondering whether there be an enlistment uh, recommendation and uh, I think with the way that it's set up now, as far as a kind of a neutral decision, uh, that's uh, the best. And also in light of uh, what I thought they were facing, uh, it was uh, an understandable uh, decision. The decision came after a day of testimony and four hours of deliberation by a panel of three Army officers at Fort Sheridan. Earlier in the day, Swanson had told that panel his decision to ditch ROTC and run away with his new bride was a gross mistake that he is not proud of. In its ruling, the military panel said Swanson lacked the maturity and responsibility to serve in the military. It was last April that Swanson and his new bride, Carolyn, were reported missing after their late model BMW was found abandoned behind Orchestra Hall. After a four-month-long nationwide search, 
the couple reappeared almost as mysteriously as they had vanished. Swanson now says he would do things a lot differently if he could do it all over again. If I could do it all over, I would be a lot more open about my frustrations. And uh, let's talk about it. Let's get it out on the table. And let's uh, decide in a, a more rational fashion what, uh, what is the best choice. And so it is that the couple who ran away to seek perfect love is facing a somewhat less than perfect future tonight. One that includes the very real possibility of having to repay thousands of dollars in ROTC scholarship money. At Fort Sheridan, Steve Sanders, WGN News. Four employees of the North Shore Gas Company are tonight recovering from burns they suffered when a gas line ruptured and burst into flames in unincorporated Libertyville today. The crew was doing routine maintenance work near a gas main when for some reason it broke, causing an explosion and subsequent fire. Three of the workers were treated for first-degree burns at Condell Memorial Hospital. They were later released. The fourth worker does remain hospitalized at Condell Memorial tonight, suffering second-degree burns. The fire spread to nearby power lines, and that knocked out electricity for some 2,000 residences. Well, a 31-year-old man has been charged with reckless homicide in connection with a fatal car accident last week on the Kennedy Expressway. Anthony Dunn was charged with three counts of reckless homicide after toxicology tests showed he was under the influence of cocaine when his car jumped at the center curb last Thursday and slammed head-on into a car being driven by a River Forest doctor. Dr. Paul Chisholm and his pregnant wife were killed. Mrs. Chisholm's two-year-old son survived. The doctors announced today that he will be paralyzed from the chest down for life. Well, Dan Rohn is next with today's news in sports, including highlights of tonight's White Sox game, and he will show you today's unexpected power hitter for the Cubs. Stay with us. The sports segment of the 9 o'clock news is brought to you by Zenith, and your Zenith dealers bring you the best in electronics. Big baseball ruling today. Well, it could be big. We'll find out when the season's over with, Rip, mm -hmm. but uh, some guys might make a little extra money here. Yeah. Baseball's free agent class of 86 was a big winner today. Arbitrator George Niccolo ruled that the owners colluded not to sign this group of eight players, which includes Andre Dawson, although he's waived his right to free agency. But the other players could be made free agents again or could collect damages after the current season is over. On the field, the White Sox are trying to finish up a sweep of the Tigers, but they're going to need a uh, comeback at Comiskey Park. It was already 1-0 in the fifth. Lou Whitaker hit it off the wall and right for a two-run double. This came off John Davis after Jack McDowell hurt his hip in the first inning and left the game. The next hitter was Pat Sheridan, and this one's falling into the gap in right center for a triple. Whitaker scored easily from second base. It's 4-0 there. It's now 5-0 in the sixth. Jack Morris has a one-hitter so far for Detroit. The Tigers also acquired Fred Lynn and Ted Power in dealer, uh, deals earlier tonight. Before the game, Sox first baseman Greg Walker, still weak but looking better, talked publicly for the first time about the illness and seizures that knocked him off the field July 30th. A month of recovery has not dulled his memory of what happened that Saturday afternoon. When I caught the ball, I felt like I had like a pinched nerve in my right hip. And I thought, you know, you know I just laughed. I remember laughing for a split second that, you know, I've got a pinched nerve in my hip and it was just kind of, I was laughing and within another second, you know, my right leg was numb, and then within another second, I knew something very serious was wrong. Greg hopes to start swinging a bat next homestand and could be back playing for the White Sox by the time the season's over. On the scoreboard tonight, again, 5 nothing Sox down to Detroit. Oakland has uh, beaten Boston and Minnesota, and Frank Viola will win his 20th game there tonight against Texas. Cleveland and Kansas City haven't done much of anything yet. Toronto loses to Milwaukee 4-2. The Yankees and Seattle are scoreless in the first. Baltimore, California later on, and in Houston today, Rick Sutcliffe used the collusion of his baseball talents to beat the Astros, although he got some help in the second inning from Andre Dawson, who cut down Kevin Bass, trying to score from second on a single. Great two-out play by Andre, and then Sutcliffe took over. Leading 1-0 in the fifth, Sut stepped up with two outs and a runner at third against Jim Deshaies. And Rick hits a high drive deep to right field, way back, Bass, goodbye! Home run for Rick Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe's first home run of the year. He didn't do bad on that home run trot, <laughs> and on the mound, he wasn't bad either. He gave up only six hits, he struck out five, and picked up his tenth complete game of the year, and the Cubs win it 3-1 today in Houston. And the fallout from last night's altercation between Don Zimmer and Goose Gossage has turned out to be minor. Gossage had gotten his doors blown off again, flipped the ball at Zimmer, and he was pulled out of the game, and this argument was the result. 
It all wound up in a team discussion following the game and a $250 fine for the Goose. I have a job to do here. My coaches have a job to do here. And we're going to do the best job that we can possibly do. And if it's for me to get on somebody once in a while when I think they've deserved it, I'm going to do it and uh, to, to take care of the rest of the ball club. Zim said Goose will pitch again when he needs him to pitch, which could be at the homestand coming up beginning on Friday. Other games, San Diego beat the Mets. It was Cincinnati over Pittsburgh. Montreal a winner. St. Louis about to be. And Philadelphia and San Francisco are in the 10th inning. The Bears-Miami game this Sunday might turn into one of the higher scoring games we've seen at Soldier Field in some time. Marino against McMahon should be fun, but the Bears' running game is the real key here, and as Sid Garcia reports, it needs to get a whole lot better. The Bears literally fumbled away games in the preseason. It's a sad fact when you consider it's the offense that's going to have to help carry the load until the defense heals. The sign of a good football team is when you have a breakdown in one area, you know, for whatever reason, injuries or... Uh, turnovers that the other part, you know, can pick you up. You know, if the offense is not doing well one week, the defense picks up the slate and vice versa. And I think that's a sign of a, you know, a good team or a championship caliber team. One player going into this season felt the sense of urgency as he hit camp fighting for a position on the team. The older you get, the more sense of urgency that you have to have. And uh, again, they drafted Brad, if not to, for him to sit in the bench, but for him to play. And eventually he will do that. Uh, hopefully it won't be before I leave. Um, no, I, I think I had a sense of urgency. You do when you get older and, and the younger guys keep coming in and getting bigger and stronger. So, yeah, things worked out well. Turnovers and injuries have a lot of people thinking the Bears don't even have a chance to make the playoffs. You can accept that or else you can fight it. And I just feel with the personnel and the makeup of this football team, we'll fight it. We'll fight it tough. Does it anger you at all? doesn't matter what it does to me, Rich. I'm a very hard guy to anger. <laughs> in Lake Forest, I'm Sid Garcia, WGN News. Well, we'll check back with him Sunday and then Monday after the game to see if he's mad or not. Uh-huh. Start calling him Teddy Bear Heaven Help Us. I doubt it. I doubt it, too. <laughs> Weather's next. Skilling's forecast follows this break. Chicagoans are heading toward the holiday weekend in fine shape. There's only a couple of chances of uh, scattered rains. One is this cool front hits the area, and that will not be till Friday afternoon. And there's a chance of a sprinkle or a shower as some cool, unstable air up there to the north comes down. But nothing expected in the immediate future, as most of these clouds are just of the high and mid-level variety, and they're marching in from the west, representing a new push of warm air coming in this direction. This, of course, is the final night of August, a month which... Uh, Came in with about three and a quarter inches of rain. Still down about a quarter inch, but better than we've done lately. This summer, though, will wind up uh, tonight as well, about four inches shy in rainfall. And a total of 160 degrees above normal for the month of August. That's a 5.2 degree above normal month, even though we've trended way down, having uh, had 14 consecutive days. The first 14 days, all above 90, two of them uh, above 100 degrees. So this started miserable, and this turned out, as you can see on the graph, very, very nicely in the area. 78 now at the lakefront, but it's cooling inland because the air is still dry and you lose a lot of heat with a light wind regime such as that that we have tonight. 43% uh, humidity, dew point 50, and it feels like it's 74 outside. Mold count back up today. The pollen count was high as well. No rain in our area, but uh, sort of a benchmark passed out here to the west today is the forest fires burning up here in Yellowstone Park past the 1 million mark. 11 states out west have 19,000 forest firefighters fighting fires that to show no sign of letting up because the air is dry out there. We're in warm air thanks to a warm frontal passage today. The moist air is out to the west. It looks like the humidity will start creeping up a little bit tomorrow, but a lot of sunshine. The rains are still to the west, and not till late in the day on Friday. Friday afternoon will they hit the emerge of two air masses over our area maybe kick up a storm. Much warmer air out to the west leads us to wonder whether or not this is the beginning of another big warm-up to start after Labor Day next week. It's very dry here. There's a storm pushing this warmth around. It looks like this warmth will block the rains over the forest fire areas over the weekend. Our computers are developing an upper air storm, and that could keep a couple little scattered weekend showers spiraling through mixed with sunshine, but no major rain systems on the way. So trending down from 89 tomorrow to 86 Friday, 70s over the weekend, 81 on Labor Day. Uh, chance of scattered storms over 30% of the area Friday afternoon, maybe a shower or two on Saturday as well. 
And down in the tropics, uh, nothing much going on right now, but down here in the Gulf of Mexico, we'll watch a weather system still disorganized, but our uh, computer models are showing this may organize in the next couple of days down in the Gulf of Mexico and head toward Texas, and we'll be watching that. Well, locally, mainly clear and milder tonight, a low down to 62, the sun up at 618 tomorrow morning. Mostly sunny, turning windy and warmer tomorrow, a high of 89. South at 12 to 27 will be the winds. And then some clouds, breezy, warmer, low 65 tomorrow night. And warm and more humid with clouds building on Friday and mainly afternoon thunderstorms, a high of 86 degrees. And partly cloudy on Saturday, maybe an afternoon shower. Sunny on Sunday. Not a bad weekend mm -hmm. coming up here, Rick. Sounds as if, Tom. Thanks. Okay. When we return, a special report on a couple of motorcyclists of the female variety in the magazine they publish hereabouts. We'll be back after a break. <laughs> Chicago's very own is brought to you by Jewel Food Stores. Take a new look at an old friend, Jewel. Motorbiking down the highway is no longer for men only. Tonight, Steve Sanders gives us a look at a couple of motorcycle mamas and their magazine, another of Chicago's very own. Time was when there was only one place for a woman on a motorcycle, behind the man. And the woman who rode on the back of those bikes was a special kind of woman. One for whom femininity took a back seat to butch. Now you can bag all your stereotypes about motorcycle mamas and biker bimbos and meet two angels of the asphalt, Linda Jo Phelps and Chris Summer, founders and publishers of Harley Women Magazine. It began as a small newsletter four years ago and has since shifted into high gear. It is now a slick 30-page monthly magazine with nearly 12,000 subscribers. I don't think we ever expected it would get this big so fast. I don't, I don't really know what we expected, but it's, it's going really good. I'm really proud of it. We now have readers all over the United States and in 14 other countries, and we have a growing number of men reading the magazine and men subscribing to the magazine, too. Regardless of who reads it, the magazine is geared to enthusiasts of only one motorcycle, the venerable Harley Davidson. Not only is it the only motorcycle still owned and manufactured by a U.S. company, it is the one bike that has created a cult-like following among its owners. In this case, women owners. It's technique. You don't have to be a, a big 200-pound guy and be six feet tall to ride one. It's technique and it's balance and it's, and it's learning how to do it the proper way. Harleys have become a legend in their own time, and there's a mystique about Harley Davidsons, and it's, it's rather hard to explain, but part of it, I think, is the power when you're riding one, and the, the feeling of independence and freedom, and there's, there's a lot of body language in riding a motorcycle. Chris and Joe are hoping the magazine will send a positive message to women bikers. It's okay to, to ride a motorcycle. It's okay to want to do things and be free and, and just be yourself. You're not alone. Whether you enjoy riding on the front of a motorcycle or on the back of a motorcycle, it's something you should do. If you want to do it, go out there and do it, because life is too short to, to not want, you know, to not try and, and go out there and give it a shot. But popular culture generally has the man riding in front and the woman on the back. Well, just maybe Harley women will change that. We're living our dreams. I mean, you just have a dream and you, it just... I think that's what our magazine is about, too. We show women that if you want to do something, you can do it. Not just with, with doing a magazine, but, you know, riding a motorcycle, being it, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Just go for it. In the meantime, if you're expecting a magazine in the near future called Suzuki Woman or Kawasaki Woman, don't hold your breath. These are Harley women, and this is their magazine. It's one of Chicago's very own. That is the local portion of our 9 o'clock news hour. We do thank you for joining us. I'm Rick Rosenthal. Now, more national and international news with Brad Holbrook and USA Tonight.